so welcome everyone. Um, this is a Guyana Speaks special. For those of you who haven't joined us before, just to say that we've been, uh, this is what I say we, that's Rod Westmus and myself have been um, hosting Guyana Speaks events since 2017. Rod is the one who had his hand up there, he's my husband. And, um, and of course the pandemic has pushed us online. So now we're, we're on to Zoom. And I think this is a really good thing because um, it's allowed us to engage with people internationally, which is really nice. Um, obviously you will have heard that the event is being recorded. And it's just to say that by joining you're showing your consent, the recorded events get uploaded onto the Guyana Speaks um, YouTube page. So if you don't know that page already, I'll put that a bit later on into the chat section. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. So um, the Twitter address is JC for Juanita Cox, and then, which is myself, and then uh, Westmas, which is our surname, W-E-S-T-M-A-A-S. So I'll put that information in. Um, the other thing is just to make sure that you stay on mute throughout. Um, but I'd really love you to get engaged in today's conversation. I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in this event. So please do put your questions in the chat and hopefully a bit later on, um, we'll be able to open it up a bit more widely for everybody to engage. The final thing I just wanted to say before I introduce our speakers is that we have an event on the 27th of March. So, um, if I haven't already said this, our regular events are held on the last Sunday of every month. So uh, we've got a regular event at three o'clock UK time, 11 a.m. Guyana time and Eastern time. So it, it'll be the same for New York and um, Toronto, but we're gonna be doing an, an event on um, life memoirs. It should be really good fun. It's just gonna be quite a relaxed event in which we're just chatting about memories. There'll be four people we, we hope, we're trying to get somebody who's gonna do um, a talk on Alice B. Singh. And also, um, Rod, what's the name of the lady that you're organizing something with? Can you remember her name? I think I have it here actually. Um, so we've, we recently came across a book called 47 Palm Street. Um, so we're going to be talking to the author who's Ruthie Richards Levi Babalola. <laughs> And, um, but we're also gonna have a, a, a quick sort of gaff session with um, Carl Brown and hopefully Carleen Baggett, if she's on board for that. So um, that's that, but coming to today's event, obviously about Oscar Abrams. Um, and I wanted to really, first of all, to say thank you to Claudia Tomlinson. I don't know if she's online, but it was her idea and she connected um, Amara Rose Abrams, who's obviously um, Oscar's daughter and connected us and she's the one that came up with the idea. So many thanks to her. We're going to essentially start off with, um, I believe a presentation by Amara Rose. And then I'll have a conf quick conversation with uh, Linton Quasey Johnson and also with Henry Mutu. And then we'll end with a short presentation, I think, from Akabra Huntley. Um, Akabra is very kindly standing in for her father, Eric Huntley. So, um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. And just to go through the formal bit, I just want to properly introduce Amar Rose Abrams. Um, Amar Rose is an arts and culture journalist based in London and an expert in specialist arts and cultural culture content production. Um, she work working in features, marketing, sorry, market and criticism. She has contributed to numerous high profile publications, including the art newspaper, Artnet News, Time Out, Harper's Bizarre Art, Dazed and Confused, T Magazine, um, which is at the New York Times. She's also, of course, as I've said, the daughter of Oscar Abrams. And uh, Amar Rose, over to you. Hello, thank you so much for that introduction. It's so nice. And I wanna echo what you said and thank Claudia as well for connecting us. This is so nice for me and a couple of our family members which have joined the chat as well, I think. Um, and um, it's so lovely to see some slightly familiar faces and to have the opportunity to talk about my dad um, and what he did. 
um, obviously these, I'm just going to talk a little bit, I think, but um, I, rather than present a whole lot, because I feel like in terms of Keskadi, I wasn't, where, where Keskadi was going at its full pelt, I wasn't born. <laughs> so I feel like you guys are better kind of equipped to talk about that, but I can talk a little bit about my dad, obviously I, I, I knew. And um, so basically I kind of wanted to start off by talking about my experience of Keskadi. Um, it's something that's come up a lot lately at work, which is strange, but great. We've had um, a poster campaign from the Tate. We've had questions, things have come up in different bits of documentary. Um, some academics have written on Keskadi. Um, some of it I know about, some of it I only hear about when it's finished, which is, I guess, how it works. But it's really interesting and great to see and I know I just know that my dad would be thrilled to know that people are still talking about it probably will not be surprised but I think he'd be very very pleased um my memories of Keskadi are the building and just early memories of walking around there I've got a very early memory of hiding behind my dad's knees where he would pull me out and make me introduce myself to everybody in the room um, what was so wonderful about that was just that he was always surrounded by these people who really kind of respected him and loved Keskadi and would talk to me about it. From artists like um, Emmanuel Jegade and people like that to writers and Henry, who I actually do recognise now, I see your face, and um, just all these different people that were in my young life, which was just such a wonderful thing. Um, I was always very aware of the atmosphere at Keskadi and what it meant. My dad would talk to me about it anyway a lot. Just also from the kind of running the gauntlet of running in a, an institution like that in the 70s in the UK, what it meant that it wasn't always, you know, people talk about Naomi Campbell, she's wonderful, but you know, it's also tough. It's uh, Islington was not the place that it is now. And there were political issues. There were issues of safety, which I think are in some ways, what this kind of movement in England were born out of um, with card and things like that, which he would describe to me as um, bringing people together, but also doing things like walking people to work and stuff like that. But as someone who works in the arts, the joy for me is to see how that then transformed from a community group to a theatre, to this um, space where people could go learn about themselves, learn about their culture, meet other people from a similar culture where they perhaps might have been disenfranchised when they came to the UK and um, be entertained and feel some sense of communality and warmth. Um, it's always straight. I think it's a, there's a good and a bad thing about having a famous, if I call my dad famous, he felt famous to me when I was a kid because everybody always knew who he was in the neighborhood. Parent, in a way, because they don't entirely belong to you. And I've been thinking about this a lot over the last couple of days, which is such a great thing in a way when it comes to things like what's important now, which is memorializing Keskadi, marking Keskadi and my dad and what he did. But it also means that you share that person with a huge group of people, um, which, you know, can sometimes you f it can be a little bit strange when you're little. But I think it's a wonderful thing when you're trying to build a memory and commemorate a place like Keskadi and all the wonderful people who were involved in it and all the ordinary people just from Islington, like um, the Evening Standard guy who would say to me, oh, I can't, oh, I was at, I was at Keskadi when Marley came. This guy from kind of just up the road who I knew randomly from being, going to the pub in Pentonville Road years ago. So there's all these memories that, you know, are wonderful for me and kind of build this kind of sense of self, which is great. Um, my dad would talk a lot about, I mean, it was, guys who knew him would know he would talk a lot about his ideas his theories what he thought of as community and what was important to him in terms of England 
he loved London, but I, he would still talk about Carnaby Street in the mid eighties um, to the point where when I went to Carnaby Street, finally, I was like, that, Daddy, there are no suit shops on Carnaby Street anymore. He's like, oh, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. He had this kind of like slight nostalgia, I think. But um, he also, you know, would talk really affectionately about Guyana. Um, I'm not sure he would tell me that he once put a cigarette in a blowfish's mouth and that made it blow smoke rings, which was something that I was fascinated with because I've never seen a blowfish. Um, do you know what I mean? In England, <laughs> I've only seen a dried one. And uh, so that would just, and just ideas of like animals and wonderful animals that he would live around, that he would talk about a lot and swimming and sailing, which is something that I did actually a lot growing up in London because my grandparents lived in Suffolk, my English grandparents. So he would talk about the water and learning to swim by being dunked, which I'm glad that I didn't have to go through. And um, things like that. He just talked about it with so much love and affection. But I feel like he his journey as a kind of, as an activist and as a doer and a bringer together of people started in the UK. Um, and um, it's something that I always, I don't know, I feel like has given me a confidence in my life. And um, I feel like as a person, I wanted to talk a bit about my dad as a person. And I was thinking about photos, photos of him. And there are some pictures of him. You can see one there, which is from a photo booth that my mum loved. And then one here of um, him and my mum. But anyone who knew my dad would know how much he loved his Rolly as he would call it. And so I have here one that he took of me, my mum and my brother. And I feel like he loved to take pictures. He loved to take photographs. He really loved that camera. And I still have it in the same camera bag that he had um, when I was little. And I've taken some pictures of it over the years, but it's actually quite hard to find the film nowadays, but I do use it sometimes. Um, and me and my brother, Kaisi. But, um, and um, he was somebody, when I think about my relationship with him, he was a great parent in a way. He would take me to museums. Obviously I write about art now, so I can't discount that. He would, no matter how much money we had, him and my mum would make sure that I had access to, um, both of me and my brother growing up would have access to um, theatre, going to things, workshops, um, piano lessons, all of these things that have guided me into my profession now and books. We have so, we had so many books. I've actually got rid of quite a lot of books, but you can see still have a huge amount of books. And I was never told what I, I was, some books were kind of off limits, but most stuff I was allowed to pick and choose. And um, along with this guidance of going and looking at things, which is now my job, um, and takes me around the world, which is something I'm so grateful for. Um, it is something that I would always do with him when I was growing up. And that's something I found really, really precious and is a precious memory for me because obviously he passed away when I was quite young, when I was about 16. So, um, and yeah, I was trying, trying to think of other things. Oh, I remember one thing memory I have is my parents would always take us on holiday around England and now I kind of think about them taking me and my brother to these trips in England my dad would wear these purple bell bottoms and kind of take us to these like kind of little villages in Somerset and I imagine that sometimes that wasn't always the most comfortable experience for them but it did give me a sense of home here as well as a sense of identity as a guy you know as his Guyanese heritage so I think I'm really 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 grateful for that because I feel that's something that again gave me a lot of confidence and must have been at times quite awkward for them, I imagine. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit also about my dad's love of Islington. I actually live near where Keskadi was now. And I just can't, when I think about my dad, I think about going to the Red Rose, which is now a recording studio. I think about him evangelizing about Islington all the time. He loved this place and it is a nice place to live. And one thing I take pride in is just the effort that him and my mom and his colleagues made in making this a nice place where you have a degree of opportunity um, 
<laughs> and I see that around me and it's a place that I feel very comfortable and I've never felt any sense of, um, you know, I feel like I've had good opportunities in this place, which is great. Um, I feel like I should now move on to um, my dad's legacy. I was, this sounds like a humble brag, but it's actually important. I was in Sharjah at the weekend um, for the March meeting, which is a kind of conference hosted by the Sharjah Art Foundation. Obviously there are issues with the UAE, but this particular conference was interesting to me with, because it was hosting, um, it was hosting a conversation on post-colonial identity and post what happens in the arts in a post-colonial world. It's, uh, it was fantastic to have this kind of conversation happening outside the West, you know, with people from all over the place. It changed the conversation and it made it, it I don't know, it was something quite radical, I felt my experience. But I did think so many of the themes brought up were things that I associate with my dad and with Keskadi, with um, senses of belonging, knowing about cultures, with um, treating people as equal, is equal um, ideas about, it, you know, what we now call intersectional feminism, but the idea that equal rights aren't equal unless everybody has them, which is something my dad would talk about a lot, um, and respecting everybody's cultures. And these things that he was very, very passionate about, and ideas just even in Keskadi's motto, um, a community that knows itself can, I think I always say define its own future, though I know that's not precisely the words, but it's so important. And these are ideas that it's been gladdening to me to hear come up in more and more and more mainstream contexts in the UK as we go through this slight, what seems to be, and I hope will have lasting impact, a change in perspective on race, race relations, colonialism and identity here. Um, and it's kind of, it's a bittersweet feeling to see these amazing conversations happening. Angela Davies was there on Zoom, not in person. Um, and to hear these ideas that I know are not new, but there is something wonderful about hearing them discussed in this broader way. As I watch and see different parts of British black culture being explored within the media and theatre and um, in books. And it's also wonderful, but I feel like a lot of these ideas, you know, credit to the people who have been holding the torch for these ideas for so many years. But, and I'm glad that people are here to see them come into some kind of fruition. I think it's really important. I, um, I, I sometimes have a slight bittersweet feeling watching things like Steve McQueen's amazing series and think, well, maybe you could do something about Keskadi, maybe, or um, something like that. So I kind of, I feel like, I hope that that is something that will come with time, not, not too much time, but you know, it's great to see things like the Tate billboard campaign and for people to take the idea of Keskadi and people who were there to um, just come up, talk about their own ideas and what they took from it and what they've gone on and done. Um, I won't list all the alumni. There are some fantastic alumni, but part of me feels that one of the greatest legacies is the impact that having these things available to people had on ordinary, ordinary people, had on people who would just come and watch, you know? And I think that's something that's really important. And I love to see everything, you know, I love to see, you know, a greater representation of Black British culture and history across the board and mainstream as it is at the moment. Um, I kind of don't, I kind of feel there's only so much I can really say about my dad in this context without kind of starting to witter on a little bit. I'm more happy to answer anybody's questions and talk about that kind of thing, but I feel like it's important to hand over to people who worked with him and who created the thing 
the wonderful thing, the, the building that was and the idea that exists now of Keskadi and everything that happened there. So I'd like to hand over to everybody else now. Thank, thank you, Amal. I, I wonder before um, handing over, I, one of the things that um, struck me about um, the Kiskadi Centre, because we haven't really mentioned, I'm just going to mention for the benefit of people watching who don't know about the Kiskadi Centre, I believe it was set up in um, 1971 and didn't close until... Hey, Jenny, are you the Jennifer that's on? Pardon? Are you the Jennifer on the Zoom? I'm Juanita. Hang on. Don't know what that's about. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I was just saying it, it, it went, it, it survived for like 20 years, which yeah. is pretty impressive. 90s, right? yeah. um, but I noticed that um, he'd, I was having a quick look on Wikipedia about it, and you never know how accurate Wikipedia is, but it, it said that he'd bought it for £9,000. Yeah. And I was really impressed with that. I mean, I just thought £9,000 in the early 70s. Um, I'm not sure when your father um, arrived into the UK, but I mean, was that a collaborative effort, do you know, in terms of... I feel like it was a collaborative effort. So I don't know the actual financial ins and outs, okay. but I feel like that was a collaborative effort between Carl Brewster, between Norma, um, between, and my dad, because um, they were the co-founders of Keskadi, along with another name I know that I don't know him personally. But um, I feel like that was something that came to, they came to together. And, you know, my dad had trained as an architect. So I guess he was doing bits of work. And then Carl was a podiatrist. So maybe they had saved up money. And I think a group of them lived on a house on Hemingford Road, shared house that was originally the Black House, um, which is where the original meetings, I think, started that then evolved into Keskadi. Um, and... I think that they came together with the money and did it together. But I, I think it's my dad was like, saw the building and had the idea to kind of, and then brought it together. But it must have been money wise, I think it must have been a collaboration, yeah. So, because I, I also had a look online to see if there were any photographs of the old Kiskadi Centre, and I couldn't find any. Maybe I didn't try hard enough, but I'm just, I'm just thinking because it was a Victor, it was Victorian mansion. It, it sounds like it was quite a huge building. It was big. It was big. It had like a fire escape going down the back. It had a big hall. It had a theatre hall. And then there was kind of in the eaves, there was a middle floor, which had kind of offices and workspace. And then in the eaves, there was um, a studio space that I think Emmanuel used. And there were other things. This is my distant memory, but it was big and it was deep, as well as being, I think, three stories. It was one big one for the theatre. It was deep. And so it was quite a lot of rooms deep. And I think there were things like catering space. Oh, there's a lady saying here that she's got a oh, photo. I've got true. some photos. Um, yeah. I'm going through a lot of boxes at the moment. Me and my me and Kaisi uh, are going through a lot of boxes at the moment. And um, yeah, uh, trying to kind of go through everything, but it's taking quite a long time. But any kind of, I saw some great pictures actually online of the kind of workspaces that were in somebody's thesis. Yeah. On disappearing spaces, which was really interesting. So, um, presumably, you've got plans to just deposit a lot of your father's work somewhere that the public will have access to, or that would be really great. That's what we're trying to do, but we have to go through it first. I think right. number one, you can't give something away without archiving it professionally, mm. and we can't have anyone else go through it. I think before we've gone through it ourselves. I yeah, want to know. That sounds like a, um, a very long project. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're getting there. We're getting yeah. there. Yeah, it's quite nice for us, actually. Yeah, no, I'm sure it must, it must feel like a kind of reconnecting in a way. Or Yeah, it's what I was a, bit, a little bit concerned that it would be this big emotional kind of thing, but it's actually really nice. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I went through a similar process with my dad's archives and I, and I, and I loved it. <laughs> it was, oh, it was nothing, point. yeah, it's much nicer than you think it's going to be. <laughs> yes, yeah. So um, thank you so much. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to um, possibly get all questions from the audience at the end. So okay. I don't know if you're OK to hold on to the end. If you are, of then course, that's I'll be here. You'll be there. Brilliant. Um, so I'm going to, on behalf of everybody, you probably can't see most people, so I'm just going to clap, clap on behalf of the audience. But thank you so much. That was brilliant. I'm going to move now. Uh, first of all, let me just take you off. Uh, Spotlight, hold on a second. 
Hello, if you here we go. Add a spotlight and take off a spotlight. Remove one. There we go. There we go. So uh, we're now moving on to speak to Linton Crazy Johnson. Um, and as the world's first, uh, uh, as the first and uh, world renowned reggae poet and recording artist, doesn't really need an introduction, but you're very well revered. Um, and I just think it's important in terms of the context to say uh, a few words. There's a lot of people here who may not know your background. So I'll just say that, of course, you're born in Clarendon in Jamaica and that you moved to the UK in 1963 as a young boy, I'm guessing 10, 11, somewhere around then. Um, you went to Tulsa Secondary School and later studied sociology at Goldsmiths College. Um, while still at school, Linton joined the Black Panthers. He helped to organize a poetry group within the movement and developed his work with Rasta Love, a group of poets and drummers. In 1977, he was awarded a C. Day Lewis Fellowship, becoming the writer in residence for the London Borough of Lambeth for that year. He went on to work as the library resources and education officer at the Kiskadee Centre, which of course was the first home of Black theatre and art. And I just want to say to everybody, I'd really encourage you to visit Linton's website. Very easy to find. It's lintonquasyjohnson.com. Um, there's loads of information on it. I found it really useful. There's, there's uh, about upcoming events, information on the record label, LKJ Records. And of course, um, you're able to get the books, music. He's got an LK shop. LKJ shop online um, that you can connect to there. Also, importantly, it shares information on um, Linton's many extraordinary accomplishments, including awards for his contribution to poetry and popular music, such as the Silver um, Musgrave Medal that he received from the Institute of Jamaica for distinguished eminence in the field of poetry in 2005. Um, Linton, I'm really deeply honored that you've agreed to contribute to today's event. Um, particularly actually having heard so much from you from a Guyanese, Deo Passard. I don't know if his name will ring a bell with you, but Deo used to, I think you knew him. Uh, he lives in Guyana now, of course, but he always used to sing your praises to me. So it's, it's really great to be speaking to you today. Um, I, I wanted to start off really by um, asking how you got involved um, with the Kiskadi Center, how you first came to meet. Um, Oscar Abrams. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, I got involved with the Cascade from the, um, the early 70s through John LaRose, founder of New Beacon Books, um, um, and Andrew Salke, who were both my mentors at the time. And uh, the Caribbean Artist Movement, which was founded by Kamal Brathwaite, um, John LaRosa, and, and Andrew Salke, um, in, 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 the la in its last phase, used to have um, a lot of his activities at the Cascade. They used to have them at the West Indian Student Centre before, but um, I, I remember going to um, events organised by CAM uh, at the Cascade, in, in the early 70s, 71, 72, 73. Um, Cascade was like an, an, a, a kind of an oasis for someone like me, um, youngster growing up in, in England, trying to um, find my, myself, locate myself in the world. It was a, a unique space. Um, I was in a theater. I mean, for a time, the Cascade was the home of black theater in London, although there were other little um, groups here and there. The Cascade was the main place. Um, and I got the opportunity through Andrew, I think it might have been one of the Caribbean Artist Movement events too. One of the first places I got a, a chance to hear the verse I was writing to do some readings. And, um, I remember I was involved in a production um, which was directed by the Jamaican poet, playwright, novelist, Lindsay Barrett. 
um, myself, uh, a Jamaican painter called Damex. His real name is Stephen Hall, but we, we all knew him as Damex. Um, and uh, we, we did a version of Voices of the Living and the Dead, which was one of my early efforts with um, musicians and dancers which staged at the Keskede back in 1973. Uh, yeah, Keskede was unique. There were so many, so much things happening there, you know, poetry readings, um, theater productions, art going on. Um, it was also a youth center. Uh, and uh, um, I remember meeting quite a lot of important people there, you know, people like, um, I think I met Jan Karu there. Uh, I met um, um, uh, my head's, my memory's gone. Um, T-Bone Wilson, Guyanese actor, Jamal Ali, who, who um, wrote, did screenplays and, and, um, and wrote a lot of plays. He was a, a, a poet as well. Um, Right, remind me, remind me of, Craig, remind me of who, who wrote in the castle of my skin. Oh, um, George Lamming. George Lamming, I met George Lamming there. Um, then, when I began working there, I, I, I met uh, Walter Rodney. I remember doing uh, one of my jobs at the Cascade was to organize seminars or, or readings and, and stuff like that for for school children, some teenagers who were attending couple of schools in the Islington area. And on one of those sessions, uh, we had John Agard. Mm. And on another time, we had Walter Rodney. I, I never even knew that Walter was a poet, but he had a couple of poems which he read. Um, yeah, so Keskedi was a very important place for me. It was very important in my formation. There wasn't anywhere else like it in London, you know, where Every, you know, so many different artistic activities were happening under one roof. Uh, my job was as the librarian um, was to procure books, not just to procure books, but to um, um, organize them in some kind of system. And I had to learn bits of the Dewey um, system of, of classification, book, book classification was, was Quite difficult. Uh, we got some. We got in some very important books. The, the you know, um, and ch the the school children um, could could have access to them. And uh, all my job description didn't include working with the youths, um, but that's I did a lot of that because those guys were wild. And um, I think the only person who could have had any control over them, it seems, was Oscar himself or me, because I was, you know, I was not much older than them. Um, guys like um, the, the, the ringleaders were Frank and, and a guy named Hewlett. And they were, it could be, um, <laughs> it could be quite troublesome, quite troublesome. I remember meeting a guy Name um, Roger Roger uh, Guinevere Smith, a quite a, a well-known black actor in America, and um, I met him in Jamaica at the Calabash Festival, and we were reminiscing about the Cascade, and he he was doing a one-man show, he said, and um, he was doing a one-man show about Frederick Douglass, and the whole thing had to be cancelled because. The guys, the youths decided that they wanted to um, play some music and they had their sound system blasting away and uh, it was a disaster. Uh, I admired uh, Oscar. Oscar was a man with a vision, um, not just a vision, but um, he was able to realize that vision. And uh, I enjoyed the, the time I, I was working at Keskedi. It just so happened that my recording, my career as a recording artist took off um, before I could really get settled down there. Uh, and, and then I, I left 
subsequently. I don't think I spent more than a year, if that long, at Cascade. But it was a very re re rewarding time, um, a very happy time. Um, learned so much, met so many people. Emmanuel Jagede, um, Nigerian artist, uh, people like Errol Lloyd, um, Damex and others uh, from the Caribbean artist movement era. Um, yeah. Great, that's so interesting. I, I'm wondering if you could say something about the CAM, the Caribbean Artists Movement, because it struck me that it, it felt almost as though, of course, the Caribbean Artists Movement started maybe a decade earlier, I'm guessing, roughly. No, it started 1966. 1966, right. And then the, the centre didn't open until 71. So in a <coughs> way, did the, did the centre take over the role of the Caribbean Artists Movement? You know, once Camus and... And, not uh, really, not really. Uh, I mean, Cascade was, um, you know, a multi-purpose art center, right. whereas, whereas the Caribbean artist movement was a loose grouping of writers, painters, sculptors, sculptors, um, and um, dramatists and so on, who um, were, were basically trying to find um, their own aesthetic their own Caribbean aesthetic, if you like, um, within this, uh, within a kind of an anti-colonial spirit of the anti-colonial movement, where they felt that they didn't, they really didn't need to go looking for validation from the gatekeepers mm. um, of literature and art and so on. That they, they, you know, they were trying to find their own, their own um, aesthetic, so to speak. So the 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 Cascade came in handy towards the end of the Caribbean artist movement as a, as, a, as a venue for some of its activities, poetry readings, play readings. I remember I saw a wonderful production of um, Okot Biptek's uh, song, song, song of Lewino, which was um, staged by um, John LaRose. And I learned so much about um, Caribbean culture, African culture and so on. Did you ever speak to, I was, I was always curious as to why, I mean, obviously the Kiskadi is, is uh, if you're Guyanese, everybody Guyanese knows it's a, a, a bird and a much loved bird that, that really reflects the Guyanese landscape, but it does too for other Caribbean territories. I just wondered why um, Oscar had chosen the, the name Kiskadi Center. I didn't know if you knew or what it I have, no, people. I have no idea. I should also mention that um, my publishers were Bogle Overture. Oh, yeah. And th there was that, there was also that connection with Oscar, you know, Eric and Jessica Huntley, um, part of the, the Guyanese mafia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, because I was wondering as well, when I, I as, as the librarian, I mean, would most of your books have been sourced from John LaRose and from Bogle Overture or like, where did the books come from? Well, we got books there? from those two places, yeah. Um, but um, you, you could get other books from, from, um, from publishing houses like Oxford University Press and so on. But back in those days, um, back in those days, um, New Beacon and Bogle Overture were the two main sources of literature. Yeah. You, you couldn't find any, you, you know, you, you, you'd be hard pressed to find um, the kind of books written by black authors about ourselves in the mainstream bookshops, you know. Yeah, um, yeah so um, certainly we got books from um, New Beacon and from Mobile Overture. So, and I'm thinking as well that m maybe a lot of the literature would have been black American literature. I mean, it would have been a mm -hmm. great period for American, UK, black diasporan kind of, um, yeah, we had a lot of African American literature, a lot of Black Power literature, you know, um, the usual stuff: Stokely Carmichael, um, um, Huey P. Newton, um, you know. Um, I can't, I can't, I can't remember all the books, but I mean, we had things like obviously we had things like um, 
Black Jacobins by Sailor James. Uh, we have uh, James Baldwin, I guess. People Capitalism from... and Slavery by Eric Williams. Yeah. Um, some and some more academic type books, um, as well as you know literature. So what's what was the kind of age group? Because you you're talking about these um, characters who were uh, quite was it Frank and uh, U U U Ulet. Ulet, yeah. I mean, what, those guys. Those guys were teenagers in their late teens, teenagers, you know. Okay. Because um, I'm just wondering as well, is was the centre there to kind of fill in for the failings of the school system here? So, like, um, did did it target younger children as well in terms of children who are kind of being who got caught up in part of the ESN system, or was it about? I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. I don't okay. know about that, but. Um, um, as well as being an art center, Keskedi was also a youth center. And right. I often thought that perhaps um, enough attention um, wasn't paid on those youths at the time. But I certainly had a rapport with them, a good rapport, good relationship with them. You know? But as I said, they were, they were maybe feral is too strong a word, but they were wild, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a fun time. I, I, I have heard um, stories of, of maybe the police hanging outside. I mean, it just sounds so typical of that period where, um, I, I don't know, whenever I see images of, of, of the 1970s and the way that the police are always harassing people and the sus laws and stuff, I'm guessing that the, that the center probably would have had some experience of that. Not while I was there. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Uh, well, that's that's good to know. Um, and I just the other thing um, I was just curious about was when you you say that your your obviously your career launched in terms of the dub poetry at that time. Uh, how, who were your? I mean, was it the people that you were meeting there that through them and interacting with them that this kind of dub poetry emerged? Or no, that was my own personal um, way of trying to articulate um, how um, the generation of youth to which I belong, mm. articulate how we felt about growing up in a, a racially hostile environment. Um, I, I discovered, I discovered um, poetry really um, in the Black Panther movement. Uh, we had a little bookshelf there with, with, with all kinds of books, Black, Black power literature. And I read W.E.B. Du Bois, um, The Souls of Black Folk, and that stirred something within me and made me want to, to write. And uh, we had a little group in the, in the Black Panther movement. Yeah, well, I think maybe it was about five of us. Some people more interested in prose, in, in novels and short stories and others in, in verse. Uh, and um, so that's how I started off. Um, so, so was oh, it? Right was, hmm? I, no, I was just curious. Then was it a kind of? Because um, I get the sense that it wasn't just cultural activism. I mean, there seems to was political activism uh, a part of it as well. Then is that very much a part or? No, I, no there wasn't much. I wouldn't say there it, there was any political activity per se what, what, that I knew of anyway. But the people. Some of the people involved at the Kesti were, were serious um, political animals, you know, people like John LaRose, mm. um, who um, went on to um, play a, a significant part in the Black education movement, um, the Black parents movement, um, the International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books. Um, the Black People's Day of Action in response to the New Cross massacre and so on. So there were some serious political activists. They were also um, involved in, in, in cultural activity. You know, John himself was a poet. Andrew was a novelist and a poet. Yeah, it just sounds like such a, a, a rich environment. I don't feel like there's a, and we don't have an equivalent of it today. It doesn't feel it like. It was very, very rich. And I feel fortunate to have, um, you know, to have experienced it and, um, and, and to have met all these amazing people. You know, I heard about Mark Matthews from my time at Cascade mm. um, through um, 
through uh, Andrew Selke, who seemed to know um, everything there was to know about um, poets from the Caribbean. And um, um, there was a Cuban, there was a Cuban, I remember a book launch there. Um, I can't remember the name of the, 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 the author of a book, but somebody had written a book on the poetry of Nicholas Quinn, the guy, the Cuban poet. Mm -hmm. And there was a session and we had a, a, a nice book launch there about that. Um, I remember Rufus Collins, um, who was a director of the theater. Oh, the living very, theater. Yeah. Hmm? Of the living theater, is that? Was Rufus, um, Rufus, Rufus Collins was, was, was the main director of, of all the plays that was on play, stage okay, at the yeah, yeah. American, a black American guy. Um, it was a bit of a character, really. And um, Iman Oscar was always in some argument or the other. But he was a brilliant, he was a, he was a brilliant director. Wait a second, I'm just going to try and get whoever's talking to... Uh... Uh, sorry. Just... Yeah, Rufus was a brilliant director, you know, and um, it was nice, you know, working around, being around these guys. I remember a guy, on, on the people who did the lighting and the, and the, and the, um, and the um, stage design and all that. I remember a guy called Witty Ford. I haven't seen these people in like, you know, 40 years or more. So, but um, T-Bone Wilson, um, who was one of our leading actors at the time. Um, and and Jamal Ali, yeah. Jamal Ali took me under his wings, really, because whenever Jamal Ali was doing a poetry event, he invited me along. And that's how I started to um to recite my poems to to outside of my normal little youth club gatherings in Brixton, you know. Yeah. So you 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 know you were involved in the um, Dread Beat and Blood. Was that was that? At, um... Well, that's the first per, the first place I gave a public a proper public reading of those early poems were at the Cascadia. At the Cascadia, okay. At the Cascadia, and I remember George Lamin was in the audience. That was in about nineteen seventy three. George Lamin was sitting in the audience, screwing up his face, you know, <laughs> um, and I said. I said to Andrew, oh my God, um, the man hated my poetry. He, he didn't like it at all. Andrew said, no, man, he was just concentrating. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> like George. I've only met George once, but that, that I got the same kind of look. I'm like, mm. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's great. Um, yeah. So, I mean, did you launch later things there or late, later poetry there or? No, that that was that was the only reading I did I did there. Plus, I did um, as I said, we did the stage in a full, proper staging of um, Voices of the Living and the Dead. Right, right. Uh, with a group of um, uh, percussionists, Rastalov guys from Rastalov. I think we had a bass player as well, um, and some dancers. Right, that was the Lindsay and that was, Barrett. And that, and that was directed by Lindsay Barrett who um, migrated to Nigeria, where he's, he still lives. I, I think he's a big chief somewhere down there. <laughs> <laughs> it's different from the Kiskadi. So, so um, did you ever get to meet Angela Davis there? Because I always heard that Angela Davis visited the center. No, I never met Angela Davis there. But, um, well, you know, we read, we knew all about Angela Davis from the Black Panther movement. And um, I, I met Angela Davis um, and, um, Stokely Carmichael, um, um, a secretary. Um, when I was doing a concert with my band in San Francisco, many, many years after, and they came backstage to say, I thought that was so nice. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I glimpsed, I, I saw her again. I think she was the main speaker at um, a memorial for Stuart Hall a few years ago. And I didn't recognize her un until they announced <laughs> you know, until they announced um or for gave her the cue for her to give her a presentation. Yeah. Um, but I never saw her at Cascade. Right, right. So what is your I mean, I'm I'm just remembering, I think it's 2011 that Islington Council put a plaque up on the building. I think it was being used as a church, maybe at the time. 
Um, well, I think it began life as a church, didn't it? It, it, it certainly looked like an old church that was um, okay. con converted to what into what it became because of um, Oscar's um, knowledge as an architect. He was able to um, transform it into what it became. Oh, wow. I think, it, but but by then I'd lost contact. By by two thousand, I'd, lo I'd long lo lost yeah. contact with the Cascade after. Yeah. After I'd left, um, that was more or less it, really. I didn't see anybody. Uh, or, yeah. Um, no, well, it's, it. it's, it's so sad because I think it was the following year that it burnt down and there's suspicions that it had been, I don't know, whether it was ravaged by fire and the, and the police thought it was suspicious. Um, no, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. No. But that could very well have been the case. Yeah, well, yeah, no, I just, I'm wondering, how do you feel about the state of racism, though? In, I know this is a big question, but just in terms of, like, the move from... Let's just, let's just stick to Keskedi. Keskedi, okay. No, 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 that's, that's fine. I was just thinking in terms of Keskedi as a, a place where everybody could meet, and now there doesn't feel like there's that same kind of centre that people can meet in the same way in terms of the kind of um you know when so many different people from different backgrounds are meeting together the kind of art and the theater and everything that's produced out of that, that i guess that's what i'm kind of thinking about but i i'll part that because I'm, I'm just conscious of the time um and i don't think i've got any questions i'm just going to double check if there's any questions in the chat um to see if anybody had any questions now somebody's saying andrew sulky wrote Georgetown journal of course yeah very important book for understanding the origins of um Cara Fasta. uh janet lawrence says she was a teenager she wasn't wild <laughs> and uh oh and then amar rose has just clarified that the kiskadi was oscar's favorite bird um oh, yeah. I think also Jan Janet Lawrence says we were a dance group called Candici who did African dance. We met Linton there and others there, T-Bone, uh, Wilson. Okay, but yeah, so no more questions. So I don't know, is it, do you have any final words you would like to say about the Kiskiti Center? Only to say that two things. One is that um, I was there when Bob Marley was shooting that, that famous video. Yeah. Um, where um, Naomi Campbell was was in it as a little schoolgirl. Um, I was there um, when he had a meeting with those those um, um, leaders from the various factions of you know in Jamaica when Jamaica was almost under civil war, mm. with, um, fighting between the PNP and the JLP and. Um, the gang leaders, I was there when the gang leaders came to meet Bob Marley um, to ask him to come back, to go back to Jamaica to do the peace concert. Wow. I, did. I was there. Um, I just want to express, finally to express my gratitude to Oscar for offering me a job because that job came right after my writer in residence. Um, I'd, I'd finished in Lambeth and um, I was out of work. Um, young with a young family and um you know it was um i was very grateful that oscar um gave me the job at the time and um Keskedi played a very crucial part in my development as i said before and um i am a better i am i'm all the better for having um um had the opportunity and experience Thank you. That's wonderful. I'm sure, especially Rose, uh, Amar Rose, you probably, that means a lot to you. That's really um, wonderful to know. And we thank you so, so much for your time and, of course, for your amazing poetry. So we really appreciate it. Thank um, you. Thank you. And hello to Akabra. Say hi to your father for me. <laughs> okay. All right, um, Linton. Can I'm going to I'm going to leave now. Okay, that's that's fine. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Right. Okay, so I'm just going to now bring on. Um, here we go. Um, bum bum, Henry. What is? I'm going to try and spotlight you. There we go. So we've got Henry. So Henry, of course, um, 
many of you will have uh, seen Henry in a recent guy in a speak. So I think it's not that long ago. Um, we had one um, that he was involved in, but just for those who weren't here, just to say that Henry has been a veteran of Caribbean theatre for somewhere around 55 years. Um, he trained in his practice at the Theatre Guild of Guyana, the University of West Indies, at the Croydon College of Art and Design UK. I believe that's where you had your, where, during the period you had your connection with the Kiskadi, um, as well as the Rose um, Burford Centre. Um, his full and varied work career includes his full-time membership of the Guyana Theatre Company, all are we, no one will forget that. Um, he was senior tutor at the Jamaican School of Drama, three-time art in residence at the University of South Florida and artistic director, Cayman National Cultural Foundation. He's the recipient of several awards, including the Cayman Cultural Pioneer, uh, CNCF Heritage Cross, Gold, Order of Cayman, um, MBE for Outstanding Services to Culture and Heritage Development of the Cayman Islands. I mean, just loads, but also importantly, um, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Theatre Guild of Guyana. So yeah, many awards for design and directing and acting. So you're very welcome um, here. I think Henry, the first question I wanted to ask was when did you actually um, start working with the Kiskadi Centre and how did you come across it? Um, well, I, I left Guyana in 1976, sometime around um, late July, I believe, <clears throat> to train in, in theatre design. Uh, originally, I acted and did some design in Guyana and my good friend and mentor, Ken Corsby, who I believe is on it, on the, in the audience here. Um, I remember him saying that you should go and do, do design because if you go to London and train as an actor, they're going to change you. Uh, you know, and I didn't want to be changed. I, <laughs> I knew that I was going to return back to the Caribbean, um, whatever happens. And so I was going for a period and I arrived in, in, in England in 1976, like I said, and um, I had to earn money because I had only gone up there with, um, with, with one year's uh, fee to be able to pay one year's fee. So I had to earn money. And a part of the earning I, I was introduced and I believe Ken had something to do with this also. But there was a Barbadian um, community development officer by the name, by the name of uh, Jeff Crawford. And he worked in Haringey at Haringey Community Relations Council. And, and then I, so he wrote a note, somebody had said that Henry was coming up. He wrote a note and said, come and do something with us. And so I came, I went with him. And I did lots of other things, stand up comedy from the work that we did with all of you and so on, just to earn a couple of dollars. And then I, <clears throat> I think Jeff told me about, about Oscar Abrams, another guy, a Guyanese uh, who was running a place called the Keskadi Center. I telephoned the Keskadi Center, uh, spoke briefly with Oscar, and he said, why don't you? I said, well, I'm a guy and he's here, but I'm, I'm training. Come down. And he said, come down and, and see me. And I went down and I, you know, I told him, I, I, I'm, a, I'm training as a designer, but I've done some design before. And I've done directing in the Caribbean and so on. And I'd be interested in being part of the thing. So he said, sure, come in. And it, it was amazing because um, this is about Oscar. And um, <clears throat> although I didn't know Oscar, as well as say Linton, and I didn't have as many deep conversations with him, I immediately realized that the vision that Oscar had for that particular place, um, for the Keskari Center was, was so expansive and it had to do with not just his love of the theater of arts and so on, but I think he, he, he looked at, at, at the broader picture, Linton alluded to this, that how does one, fit into society that almost rejects one. And, um, and I believe that that was part of his vision, even though it, it may not have been art, articulated directly from the work and looking at Kessidy Center and the, and the terrific importance it had in the development of, of, of um, uh, Black British culture and, and Black Caribbean British culture in particular, because it was essentially, to, the people that I met there anyway, were essentially Caribbean people. There were a couple of Africans also, and 
and also a few English actors used to come through. But it was just, I'm really very lucky because those the two and a half years that I spent with Kiskari, and, and remember, I wasn't a full-time worker. I was training, and so my focus was always on completing my work in college. I wasn't going to allow any other job to stop me from, from getting through college. And so I, but Oscar and I talked, you know, I would, I would go in to direct and, or to design essentially, and, and we would meet and I would tell him what the play is about and so on. And many of the plays that I selected um, were from the Caribbean. Uh, I remember doing uh, uh, Eric, sorry, Eric Roach's Belfanto. Oh. Um, then I passed on scripts of Mal Couchon to Rufus Collins. Um, who was the director of the company, but, but who generously allowed me to direct. And I think, I, I think Rufus was, a, that's another story for another time of how incredibly um, um, good an actor and director Rufus was and how important he was, both to the Kiskadi and to theater in Britain. Of course, he moved on to Holland a little later. But that vision of, of Kiskadi, and I, I, I lament a lot that it never, continue because it would be just incredible. And sometimes I look at what's happening, you know, through various programs and so on, um, on, on actors in, in Britain performing at the national and so on. And while I, I'm not, I can't claim to be in touch with everything that's happening in England right now in the theater, I always think that maybe I would have liked to see, you know, these, for example, like the Desmond, there are shows like these who, which were operating around that same time period we are talking about that we don't see again, you know, and which, which stamped what it was to be Caribbean. And, and, and it was our own response to, to what was happening. Um, but Oscar was, what I remember of him, like he was a, he was a hard taskmaster in a way. He, he would walk around the building up and down. And although I was attached to the theater mainly, um, I would, go around the building, I would go downstairs, there was a basement downstairs and I would go and there would be fellas there playing music and, and, and um, you know, whether, they, whether it's guitar, drums, bass, and whether they're playing music, there was a table tennis table that they would could play table, uh, table tennis. And, and my favorite spot, of course, when I was there and I had time was the library. And Linton uh, probably would not have remembered me because I was not like sort of like, directly involved, I would design and I'd be quiet, quiet in the background. But I remember going up to the library to read a lot and I used, I met Linton up there and, um, and you know, I would ask him about books and so on, what he has up there and so on, because I had known a lot of the books before, but some of them I've never read. I'd known them and never read. And then, and so part of that meeting with him, we didn't talk a lot because Linton was not somebody, at least in my experience, who talked a whole lot. Um, he's very usually very quiet. Um, I didn't know of his experiences with the, with the young lads there, but I knew the lads and I knew that they were always, you know, um, it was a fairly noisy place at times. And I remember the, because Linton preceded me, you know, when he went, I think he, when I came, he might have been in his last few months because I missed him shortly after that. And, um, and one of the things he talked about, a lot of the people I met and knew, like, like, um, again, Eric wouldn't remember me. I used to go to their, their bookstore to buy books. Um, at, at, um, uh, the Bogle, Bogle Overture. Bogle Overture. Mm -hmm. But the person I, I sort of lined more with or, or, or had more associated with was John LaRose. Because uh, Christopher Laird, who was one of the producers, a good friend of mine who was a producer of the All of We in, in Trinidad, um, had mentioned John LaRose, who was Trinidadian, and said, when, when you go to London, you must go to New Beacon Books, go to see John LaRose. And so I went there. I bought a lot of books. Um, usually, that was the place I go, went to for books. And John and I talked a lot. And when I knew that he, he knew about Carnival, when, when I was researching my thesis, I, I interviewed him. And I, I regret every minute of my life that I don't have that interview. I had I, I lent him the tape back because he wanted a copy of it. And then we lost contact with each other. 
and I never got the tape back, but it was a, a long interview with him talking about the early steel band movement and, and the whole Caribbean arts movement and so on in Britain. We talked a lot of that, um, which helped me when I was uh, writing my thesis. But at the center itself, it was a dream. It, it, it really was. And while I was mainly involved in the theater, the, the shows that we did there, Rufus Collins was, like, like I said, I mean, it, it, it's, it's impossible to understand how good he was to the center and what he meant to the center. And I think when, when, when he left, it was, it was about the time, it must have been, he must have left around, because I left London in, in, in December, I think, of 1979 or, or January 8th or something like that. And um, Rufus was ill in hospital just before that, and I went and saw him. And then shortly after that, he moved to Holland. Now, I don't know the exact time, but I think that the Kiskadi, you know, had been, it, it started to fade out, I think, around the 8th, I don't know, 80s or something. And then I, again, unfortunately, I, I was never in contact with Oscar after that. Um, but but tried to follow the work. But then I then I heard it, was, it had burnt down. And I remember seeing the Marley video. I wasn't there for that, but I remember seeing the video and thinking, hey, hold on, hold on, this is Keskari. Because I knew the building, particularly the interior of the theater. I knew it very well because I designed a lot. Um, we, we did shows like Kuvad. Um, Derek Walcott's pantomime, I believe that, and I, I don't want to say this is so, but I think it was the first time that that particular play was done in England, uh, uh, pantomime, and, and, and there was a Guyanese actor, I don't remember his name now, um, he worked a lot with, um, with, 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 with um, the, the Guyanese playwright. Or with Michael Abinsetz. Abinsetz, he worked with Abinsetz, right? I, and I saw him in a play called Alterations. And then I think it either before or after that. But anyway, he did that with, a, with an English actor called um, um, Eric, Eric Richard, who went on to do quite a lot of work after that, was in Shogun and so on. Um, I met people like all the people, you know, that, 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 that Linton mentioned were there around the time when I was there also, but, but I didn't. I didn't have a big friendship with them because, like I said, I, I had to get back. When I come to direct, I direct and I left. I designed and I left. I didn't hang around the center a whole lot, just enough for me to, to see them. This is, um, this is Eric, Eric in the foreground, and this is and, and, and the Guyanese actor um, doing pantomime at the Keskadi. Um, and we had lots of critics came in. There they, they were, they were things in time out about it and so on. And, you know, the place was rocking. It was the place, as Linton said, it was the place to be if one wanted to deal with the arts in, in London during the 70s, certainly at the time I was there. And then the, the, the other one there, that this one was called, um, you'll see this slide. Okay, come with up. me a second. I, I think there's a bit of a glitch on this. Hold on mm -hmm. a second. Yeah. I want to be able to bring it up in full. So bear with me. Um, yeah, but the, 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 just as you, while you talk, while you come up, I'll continue with it. The, the plays were selected specifically to, 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 to fit into the frame of what Keskudi was about, um, race relations. When, when you look at a play like Derek's Pantomime, you know, with two, two people starting out at lava heads, one, one the colonial person, one the, 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 the West Indian um, and, 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 and they had to go through a whole series of, 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 of meeting and talking and, and reconciling and so on until, until at the end they realized that friendship was important to them and respect and, and was important to them, mutual respect, if they were going to move forward. I mean, this one is called Belfanto, which is just a folk story um, about ownership of land. And, well, it's not about ownership of land, but part of it had to deal with ownership of land, about families feuding and so on, which again, if you if you look look at that in the context of, of our own history, you will see that that if you think that we are a family and, and there's all this feuding going on among among us, then then something has to give or something has to happen to change that. But you'll see the names on this, people like Yvette Harris, um, um, Bob Phillips, uh, Malcolm Frederick, Pretty Ford, who who um, uh, uh, Linton mentioned was in this. Um, and Camilla Blanche, she was actually a young actress um, um, now coming up. I think this may have been her second or third production. And Lucita Lijetwood, who was, who was from Trinidad, she was Trinidadian. 
And, and um, but Malcolm went on to do a lot of good work and, and so did Yvette. Um, you know, and then, and then I designed and directed this one at the center. Um, I, I'm afraid this doesn't have the year, but it, it, it would have been probably 77 or at the very latest 78. I, I, it's 79, here it is, 79, here you go. Can I, can I ask you, Henry, was anybody conscious of the importance of what was going on at the Kiskadi at the time? I mean, did, was anybody thinking in terms of archiving this material or cataloging no, it? Yeah, I, this is the thing. It, I, I think perhaps if Linton had stayed on, it would have been archiving. I think, I think because he, he, was, he had that kind of sensibility. Um, I, 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 per, I particularly, I archived, when I say archived, I collected the stuff that I did. In other words, I would do the posters and I would, because I did the posters when I were there and I did the, um, I collected them for myself. I took pictures and I, I kept them, but I don't know that there was an actual archival, uh, a sort of archive of the theater goings on and all the people and photographs and their speeches and so on. And that would be a fascinating subject for anybody doing a PhD to tackle. Um, it's too late for me to do that now. This is a wonderful play, and one of the people that, and, and he may have post dated Linton, is a guy named Edgar White. Edgar White was from Montserrat, and he wrote some terrific plays. And one of them, this one here, um, was a play about South Africa and the ghettos of South Africa. And it was called, I think this was called Masada. And this was in, in this, this setting here, which I did, was like a little Shabin area in, 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 um, in Soweto. And these are the two characters. This is an African. She may have, I think she may have either been from, gosh, I don't want to say, I don't want to say Ghana, but um, her name was Millie Kairi. And Trevor Ward, I think this, this, this young fellow, is, his name is there. And, and there were two, again, two actors in the production. And we took this production. This production was, it was performed at the Royal Court Theatre upstairs. It moved from Keskadi to the Royal Court. And then it moved from the Royal Court to, to the Sutheran Theatre in, in Amsterdam, where, where because of Rufus's connections with Holland, and he had directed at the Sutheran before, and um, and he he, he got, got to take the production uh, to Holland. So this was shown, you know, quite a bit, and and I think. I, I just wanted to ask you, because obviously theatre is quite expensive in a sense, you know, I mean, to put on these performances, you need all the props and everything else like that. I'm just wondering how it managed to sustain itself. I mean, was there, was there a huge, was the audience um, mainly African Caribbean or was it, did it appeal to a wide range of people? Well, I think it appealed to a range, but mainly, mainly African Caribbean people, but there were other people and there are many English or if you want to call, use the word white people there. I mean, I, I although the, I think people knew the Cascadia, knew what it meant. Um, it, and it was expensive because people were paid um, equity rates, right? So I, I sent you a little note of a slip. <laughs> you yeah. Yeah. one of my pay slips, which, which- Oh, your pay which, slip, oh, I didn't see that. Yeah, it's there, it's a little, a little Cascadia bird head on it. It was one of the things I sent you. Okay. Um, and and it had like I don't know sixty to sixty pounds or something like that okay. for the week. You know, if I was working every day, I think it was like ten pounds a day or something like that. But I mean, imagine paying, and it was close to equity rates. Um, paying these things. This is Kesk This is um, this is Michael Jilks Kuvad, and you'll see I designed it, both the settings and costume, and you'll see in the in the background. I painted the walls of the Kiskadi, the interior walls. We stretched canvas, well, not the walls, we stretched canvas all across the walls. And this was sort of a forested area in Guyana, which I painted hours and hours and hours, painting those walls and all the leaves and whatever. And, and you'll see it stretched right across. And we did this in the room. It Who wasn't on the stage. make the um, costumes? Well, I did the, I designed them, but I didn't, um, I didn't sew them. I, and I honestly, I wouldn't be able to tell you that. <laughs> but I know they just turned up. You know, people, I think there was a group of people who were very interested and who supported the theater. People really loved the theater. A lot of the young people who came in loved the theater and people that I never knew personally, you know, that, that were support staff that came in. And I think it is a credit to Oscar because he was able to, to attract a lot of these people. Now, I don't know if everybody was paid. Um, and, and so I can't say that, 
But I know that the, the, the bigger actors, meaning people like the T-Bone Wilsons or Malcolm Fredericks mm -hmm. or um, Frederick, I think, and uh, with, with the Ford and so on, I'm sure that those people paid. Edgar White was paid his royalty, um, I believe, for his for his plays. Yeah. And people, it, I, it would be interesting if people who don't know Edgar's plays to maybe try to locate them and read them because- I, they, I think you, there's, um, there was one he, he did called Lament for Rastafari. La Rastafari, right, um, right. And then La Femmes Noir, the black women. Yeah, that may have been that may have been before my time or maybe okay. after, okay. but I don't think he did much after I left. Right. I think he left almost immediately for Holland mm -hmm. and he passed away in Holland. And I, I found it, as I was saying, this is Kesley again. But these are like spirits, sort of. And you'll see this. He was the shaman. And Ken knows this play well because he did one of the most fascinating productions of it in Guyana and designed a set, which I think is still uh, uh, the best set. Uh, this is know. all uh, Michael Jilks's Kuvard, is it? Michael, Michael Gilles here, who, was, who lived in London at the time of his passing from COVID. And um, uh, yeah, this was his play, a terrific piece on, on race and reconciliation, but specifically written for Guyana, but obviously with echoes for any kind of society in which there is, there is sort of, you know, um, divisions of race and, and uh, cultural and racial divisions. Um, and it's a terrific piece. And um, it's a standard guy in his fear yeah. and it, so, it isn't put no. Henry so then then I guess all most of the plays were written to address were they kind of addressing black issues at the time or um kind of expressing the black experience yes I, I think I think many of them were but I think Kuvad for example wasn't just about the black experience it, because it was Guyanese and if you know Guyana it's about you know a little bit more Indians, you're just barely, maybe 2% or so, and Africans maybe making up about 75 to 80% of the population. They're, the narrative on, on culture and the arts in Guyana is always centered around these two races, particularly because the two political party parties are a are, are thing. And without getting into politics, it, the, the, it, this was written to bring a sort of, to try to reconcile people, which, is, which has been going on. And I think if you look at the experience in, in London, it is, I don't, from my perspective, it is not, I don't believe that it was just one side talking about this because they wanted to talk about it. It was because they felt marginalized, because they felt that they were being reduced to nothing in a society in which they had contributed to its building. And therefore, from their perspective, they, they, they wanted to be able to, to let people know that they were human beings also, and that they were capable of, of good things and they wanted to be respected and to, 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 be, to live in dignity in their own society. So a lot of the plays without going in specifically to the, to, to the race issue as it was dealt with in some parts um, in, in, with, by some other, other commentators and so on. I think it dealt with, with it from, from that broad perspective. Uh, Mal Pouchon, for example, uh, this is Mal Pouchon. And like I said, I, I know Witty Ford is the old man to the right. Um, and the youngster, I think his name was Roy Cohen. He played the the, the husband. Uh, this boy, this fellow, I know, so I keep calling him boy, but this is he played the moon, who was the Duff and them youth. And I think in the middle was Chantal, the character Chantal. And I think that is Imru Caesar. Somebody might correct me, but I believe that that was Imru, who who was again another terrific actor and, and, and theater man who passed through 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 the the Kiskadi Center. So yeah. I, I mean, uh, <clears throat> the plays that I selected certainly had a wide ranging appeal, um, but it did address these issues um, or race issues in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of indirect way. I mean, pantomime, for example, explored it, but essentially pantomime looked at it from the point of view of, yes, you are this, I am this, but the only way we can move on from this is through, through mutual respect. And I think that concept still holds for almost any society in which one set of people feel that they are somehow superior or have a God-given right to, to, to dictate what others should be. I think pantomime is one of those players, but essentially it's about two, two human beings, two people who, who are looking um, to be able to, to work through their issues and come to reconciliation. This is a little clip from the, from, you know, a notice for the play. 
and I don't remember which paper this is in, but you can see where Masada went to the theater upstairs at the Royal Court. I, I was wondering initially if it might have been in Time Out, because I think you mentioned that, that a lot of the plays were advertised in Time Out. Yes, they were always, all, we were always advertising Time Out and we, and we had critics. They, as a matter of fact, I couldn't find it, but I have a critique of, um, of pantomime from, from, from one of the major critics at the time who worked for one of the major uh, 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 magazines, but I don't remember his name, but I'll, I'll find it. And sometimes I, I, I can send you it, but I, but yes, you see, Kiskadi was well known. It was well known. And, and like Lyndon said, it was a community center with, 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 with the focus being theater. And, and he is right when he said that perhaps enough attention may not have been paid to the youths. And, and, but I don't think that, to give Oscar credit, his vision was large, and I don't think that he would have had the funding necessary to employ the amount of, of you know, officers and so on that it would have taken to continue. Because you could see from the, the germ of Keskiri, you had the education part with the library where people could go and read, you had the games area, you had a place where people could go and play, they could come and play their music, and you had the theater, which would bring in, um, and literature, which would bring in the, the more if you want to call them important, or, or the more experienced uh, cultural people, cultural uh, uh, writers, artists, and so on, and even cultural activists into the building so that the youth could learn, could come to these things and learn from them. Now, I went to productions you know, that I, I directed and some other productions, but, but, but because I was studying and, and many times I was working at the same time at the pub in the evenings, I couldn't go to every production. Can but, I um, ask you, Henry, how many how many plays did they kind of put on? Was it, you know, they they would have a play that would run for a set number of weeks and then have a yes. play, or yeah, yeah. They, they would run a play. I think sometimes for two three weeks, if I if I remember rightly, maybe 10, 15 performances, depending, you know, and um, and then they would move and and one would be like like one would be uh, worked on while one was going. It would, there was a lot of stuff happening, not just the work that I did. But Rufus did a lot of other productions and, and, and um, you know, readings and so on outside of what I did. Yeah, so there was, the, the, I mean, the place was a hive. It was a hive and it was the place to be. And, and, and credit, as this is about Oscar, we, it's, it's almost difficult to give him enough credit for that vision that he had, which um, lasted for quite a long time. And when you think of the amount of people, you know, when you think of Marley and, and, and Lamming and all these people that went through there, um, you could understand the attraction that Kiskadi had. And it's a pity that, you know, that it couldn't, I guess everything doesn't, you know, everything doesn't last for a very long time. And, and it had a, perhaps it had to, at some point it was without funding and without support from, from other Caribbean people there um, and uh, not just as mem audience members, but financial support and so on, because I don't know that side of it very well. But I ran the, you know, the Cultural Foundation in the Cayman Islands for 33 years, and I know that without funding um, from the society, the organization then becomes dependent on government or on, on people, uh, other people to support it, who may not necessarily share your own vision of, um, of, of what, yeah. you know, what is, is a... So, so um, probably at the, I don't know, things were very different at the time, but I was so gratified to see New Beacon bookstores um, manage through a crowdfunding to, to, I don't know if you heard recently that that nearly closed down, but they managed to stay yeah. on. And I guess it's easier now for the community to organize, whereas probably yeah. it was a bit harder then. How did, yes. I mean, how did most people hear about the Kiskadi? Would you say it's by word of mouth or, or, um, I would think by what I see, you know, you know, these so when something happens and it's there's a kind of a ground swell, there's a sort of a of a buzz in the air. And and somehow if you were an artist or if you were a person that's interested in your own culture or your, the idea of your own culture, if you want to call it that, you're going to find a way there. Eventually the news is going to get to you. So I would say word of mouth is is one of the of, of, the, of the main thing. And remember, you know, because Kiskadi had people coming to it. The, the, the camp people and various people coming, it was easy for those people then, then to spread the word around. So it wasn't being spread just by the theater 
audience, theater audience or audiences that come to a concert or a poetry reading and so on, or the fellows who are there as part of the center coming in and out and, and, and doing their work. So if you imagine the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of people coming in, the word was eventually going to spread. And once people came there, there was this electricity about the place, um, which, which, which I picked up immediately. And one wanted to be there because, you've, because I felt that I was in a little enclave, so to speak, of the region of the Caribbean. I was hearing the voices and so on. And remember that my world at, at, the, at Croydon College, where, 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 where I must admit freely that I had wonderful tutors. I, I'm still in contact with many of them. But my world was a slightly different world. It wasn't the Caribbean world at Croydon College. And because I was from the Caribbean and, and, and I, I, I loved hearing the sound of, 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 and the music of the language and so on, and, and because Ken had afforded me the opportunity to travel with the all we all over, I had become more attached to, to who I was in the region. And so coming to London, you know, my father had gone, had been, and he must have been one of the first people on this, um, what you call it, the Windrush generation, because he left in June 1948, you know. So, and he lived in London and he, and he was, you know, and, and I think he was a tailor essentially. He didn't obviously get involved in a lot of this, uh, these movements because I don't know whether he was an artist at all. He, he was a craftsman because he was a tailor. But, but, um, but because he was there and so on, I, it was, I wanted to find out what um, was going on. And, and when I went to Kiskadi um, for a job more than anything else, then I think that period of my life was, was incredibly important um, to understanding you know, London and what was happening in England and, and, and my sister who lived there from since the 1960s also. And, and what her life would have been and so on. So yeah, it was an education for me and, and which I wouldn't trade for anything else. That's, that's wonderful. And again, Henry, and again, thanks to Oscar, thanks to Oscar, because I think if, if, if he, and you know, and he say, because he, he just, I called him and he just said, come. So, yeah. so it wasn't like he didn't know me and, and you know, and he didn't know me from, <laughs> from, from anywhere. So, but you know, I you know, I obviously because I knew he was a Guyanese, and obviously you play the Guyanese card. Hey guys, I'm a Guyanese in London, and so on. Yeah, yeah. And if I can pause it, if I can pause it, uh, uh, an idea of why he may have named the place Kiskadi. I'm not saying this is why, but you know, somebody who is in theatre always looking for for why people do things and why writers write and so on. I mean, if you think of the Kiskadi had a, the, the Kiskadi bird was had a call. So it, it, forget about the color, the crown on the head and so on, you knew that. So you would have had to have a visual. But if, when the Kiskadi called, every Guyanese knew the call of the Kiskadi. So it was a recognizable call. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if one takes that to perhaps its limits and say that he must have known that this call is a recognizable call. And so the name for a center that he would set up would have a recognizable Caribbean Black British call. You know, um, uh, Henry. I'm going to put it at that and I leave it. It's a thank, guess. Thank you. I was just going to say, we are running out of time, but just yes. picking up very quickly on what you said. Um, also, Kiskadi was named by the French, and apparently it comes from Keskildi, as in what did he yes. say? So I love I love the idea of it being theatre and then it being a, a, a you know, a space <laughs> where you, you're expressing yourself. So it's actually a very apt uh, name. But I, and I also wanted to mention this final um, drawing here, um, yes. because it's actually at the um, Tate Britain at the moment. So just to say to the audience and people listening, if you haven't already been to see Life Between Islands, Caribbean British art from the 1950s until now, it's really, it's the best by far exhibition, an absolutely landmark exhibition. Um, and this piece also happens to be there. There's loads of work too from people like, um, gosh, who did the drawings for George Lamming's book? Um, 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 I'll tell you what, Dennis Sorry. Williams. Dennis Williams, that's it. Loads of pieces from Dennis Williams, brilliant paintings by um, Aubrey, um, Aubrey Williams and I mean, Hugh Locke's in it and uh frank bowling said i mean it's just an absolutely fantastic uh exhibition with a lot of guyanese being showcased and of course a lot of other people from the caribbean region but absolutely fantastic 
So yeah. I'm just gonna I'm gonna stop us there. But thank you so so much, um, Henry. That was really brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, really enjoyed hearing all about the theatre side of things there. I want now, I'm going to stop sharing you. So I'm going to bring in Akavra and I need to just remember where she is. So hang on, um, get rid of that. Participants. Akavra is here. Add spotlight. Um, hang on, hang on. Spotlight. There you go. We should have back a breath. Oh. Perfect. So thank you. Um, thank you, Henry, for that. And lots sure. of virtual clapping going on. But I just want to now introduce Akabra uh, properly. Akabra, of course, I asked for a bio and she gave me like a one line sentence, which is very, <laughs> just like Akabra. So I thought I would say something a bit more than that. And um, Akabra, of course, is a published uh, poet. I think many people on here will be aware of that. And you've also um, performed nationally and internationally on radio and television. Her work has been anthologized in collections, including James Berry's News from uh, Babylon, which is 1984, and children's anthologies like Grace Nichols, uh, I think the book was called Black Poetry in 1988. She leads poetry workshops in schools and is a member of the Poetry Society's Poets in School Scheme. And she's currently head of psychology at a local secondary school. Akaba, of course, was named after one of the leaders of the, 1917, uh, of the 1763 Burbese Rebellion and is the daughter of the activists and publishers Jessica and Eric Huntley, who, of course, founded Bogle Overture in 1969. So, and Uncle Eric, of course, is now in his uh, 90s and has asked her to present on his behalf. And as you know, you can't argue with an elder. So <laughs> we have Akava, and uh, we thank you so much, Akava, for stepping in on his behalf. So yeah, over to you. You're very welcome. So um, this is me reading in dad's voice. I do not remember when I met Oscar and I do miss Jessica for two heads are better than one. I suspect he and Jessica met at Festac in Dakar in 1966. But regardless, he appeared in our lives and became a personal family friend and comrade. He was so knowledgeable in so many areas which we were not, or he knew someone who was, and this became invaluable to us, but more on that later. He was a remarkable person. His career covered not only founding the Kiskadi Center, with local politics, architecture, building, and printing. So a little bit about printing. Many of the older printing establishments in Fleet Street were changing, both in terms of location and equipment. Oscar saw an opportunity to purchase this seemingly outdated equipment, and perhaps from the GLC or Urban Aid, he raised funds to establish a training facility for young people. The objective being that they would be able to take on the printing jobs required by the council and prepare young people for employment. The printing establishment was situated near the present day Arsenal football ground. I do not remember what caused the collapse of the printing, but this didn't result in despair. He turned his attention to an empty old wreck of a church in Gifford Street and transformed the building into the first and only African Caribbean art centre providing the community with a base and opportunities to promote, encourage and facilitate the artistic creativity within the community. A more appropriate name would be a cultural centre. It was an exhibition space, a workplace for sculptors, painters, plays were staged, concerts, concerts and dances were put on, poets and storytellers had their space to fulfil their dreams and ideas. Two of the artists I remember that used the Kiskadi Centre as their studios were Emmanuel Jagade and Aubrey Williams. I'm not certain how Oscar organised it, but my son with Russ Messengers, who were part of a group from the Keskadi Centre that went to New Zealand as a cultural exchange. Mm. The Keskadi Centre was important, as while other establishments shut their doors to us at 10 o'clock, the Keskadi Centre, at the Keskadi Centre, the intellects and plebs could continue to thrash out ideas 
continue putting the world to right until two o'clock in the morning if they had to. I now would like to share my screen and show some slides that Beverly Mason very kindly sent me from the Falmer archives. Um, and maybe, oh, I can't share my screen. Can I share it, Juanita? Can you? I just need to make sure you've got some um, co-sharing on here. Oh. I don't know why it's not. It doesn't have the facility. Oh, there you are. Should I try again? Yeah, you should try, you should have it now. No. 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 Let me continue to read and then I'll come Do back. You want to can you put it in the link maybe and I can share it or oh it says you have it again now uh, you... oh, yes. yep okay good uh, let me Is that any good yep we can see that Okay, so there are a couple of slides. If you can um, expand it, that mm -hmm. fills the screen. No, the, the little box to the uh, left. You see there's a little box at the bottom where you were going uh, to the plus and minus thing. On the minus side, there's a little box next to it that should blow it up. That's the one. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yep, good. good. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, these are taken from the archives where BLP deposited um, paperwork, etc., at the LMA, so from the Falmer archives. And they're just a few posters and one photograph. You enlarge that again, please, if you can. I'm not sure that I can. But because you had done. Oh, you had done, and it's good, yeah. And it's it, gone, it, it, yeah, so you had done. The look. So I think, yeah, to get the font bigger, if you go back to where you were before, sorry, that's my my fault. Yeah, that might. I think that's as big as it can go with yeah. um, them. Um, I might have lost the order now. So yeah, these, these are just a few posters and people can check the names of the contributors. Mm. Um, lots of these actors have been mentioned already, T-Bone Wilson and mm. Millie Chieri and Imru Caesar. So meetings as well as plays, founding conference. Well, so that, it looks like they had a lot of very varied kind of meetings. Mm. And uh, Henry shared that before, didn't yeah. he? This one I thought was interesting. I wasn't sure. It says Roots Rock Reggae, the Mighty Diamonds, featuring the Mighty Diamonds, the Abyssinians, Abyssin Abyssin Russ, Michael White, Bob Marley, Inner Circle, Big Ute. And yeah, it was I guess it doesn't say what year it is, does it? No. Um, no. Um, Errol's asking who made the posters. Errol, I think with the ones that were um, plays that um, Henry is involved in, Henry designed them. I don't know who designed these other ones, though. I um, don't know if it says on them, but... Mm -hmm. this one's in an autumn room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Derek Walcott's remembrance. Uh. Mm. 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 
the mention of philosophy. Yeah, and Rufus Collins, of course, the yeah. African American. And over here it says that poetry readings every last Sunday of the month, mm -hmm. which is a. Oh. And did yeah, you, Edward, did you um, perform any poems there? Um, I can't remember personally. I was, I was little. I know. Yeah, yeah, you would be. But you know, you you started very young, so I just I wondered if. Uh, you yeah, had, I don't uh, remember. I remember playing at the Keskadi as a. Oh, so, Be Beverly's saying yes, you did. <laughs> so we can see Oscar on the left here. Okay. okay. I don't know. Maybe if anyone can recognise anybody else, and they put them, put the word, put the names in the chat, that'd be really helpful for us mm. at the at Falmer. Mm. Is that Yvonne Brewster, in with the shawl? Yeah. Yeah, that looks. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's Yvonne. Henry Seinfeld, if it is Mike, it's me. Mm. Don't, don't know that I recognise anybody else, but... No, it'd be good if um, people... Well, know. yeah, if anybody knows. And there's one final one of a aerial view. Oh, that's the actual... Do you know that's the first time I've actually seen the uh, picture of it? Um. It's amazing. It's it's a it's a very deep building, so it's not just tall. It's quiet. It looks like it was a very huge space. Yeah, three floors, I believe. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, continue. If that's okay. Um. The knock-on effect, Dad's saying, from the cultural activity of places like the Kiskadi Centre was that larger publishing houses like Heinemann and Macmillan both revived their African Writers series. Such was the influence of the creative arts at the time. The 80s, I feel, were like a renaissance, a blossoming of African-Caribbean artistic expression um, of which we can see the fruits in Britain today. When the Walter Rodney Bookshop was closed in the late 90s, Oscar found space for us at the Keskadi and we, relocate, we, rele, we relocated much of our stock and records there. This was also around the time, 1982, that Oscar designed and supervised the conversion of our house into two flats. He personally oversaw everything about the project, mm -hmm. from employing trades, selecting the colour of the paint for the walls and hanging pictures. This was one of the most difficult times for us, and Oscar graciously converted a, build, converted a building site into our home, for which we are eternally grateful. He also came to our rescue at a time when computers were being introduced. I was very hesitant and didn't take to the change readily. However, I remember he provided a step-by-step -step manual on managing the change from typewriter to computer, and we somehow managed. He was always very generous. He enjoyed a quality of life, which allowed visits to restaurants, the theater, relaxing in the company with friends in pubs and in our homes. He was a card holding member of the Labour Party and of CARD and found time to play an active role in Harringay and Islington local elections. He, along with Ian MacDonald and others, organized responses to young black men arrested under the then SUS laws. My story of Oscar is both personal and community, the interrelatedness of the two. Oscar, vivacious doer, he could never say no. Thank you. Akabru, that was lovely. Thank you. I didn't even realise that um, Ian MacDonald had been in the UK. Um, yeah, so that's really interesting hearing Ian MacDonald and him being involved in, in um, activities against the sus laws. That's something I hadn't expected to hear. But yeah, really appreciate that. Thank you so much, um, Akabra. Really, <laughs> really great. I'm just gonna, um, okay, so let me just remove the spotlight so you don't feel like we're, we're just <laughs> homing in only on you. Um, spot, did I have that on there? Oh, hang on, here we go, that's where I need to do it. Okay, so now we're just on a general um, chat thing 
Um, I just want to read quickly through some of the comments on here. Um, oh, actually, there's a photograph Beverly shared. Let me see if I can get hold of this. Um, that's from the Huntley Archive. Um, can you see it? Akaba, are you able to see the picture? Oh, you are. Fantastic. Yeah, so that's Jessica and uh, Angela Davis. Um, I don't know what year this is from. I'm thinking 74, maybe, somewhere around then. I don't know, Beverly, if you know. Um, 1974. 74. Yeah, 74. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, no, because I knew she um, came to the UK on a visit in 74 when she was talking about in support of the um, South African uh, political prisoners, wasn't it? Yeah, in 74. So that's, thank you, Beverly, for that picture. That's amazing um uh, imra bakari that's from the photograph isn't it that you were mentioning oh was also a regular playwright and actor there okay 79 didn't know that and um, beverly also says in support of the conversation jessica huntley collected dozens of materials posters flyers and some photos about the kiskiddy center um and obviously those are the ones that um Akabra has just shown but just to say, if you're interested in those and you want to find out more, they're at the Bogle Overture Collections at the London Metropolitan Archives. You should visit the London Metropolitan Archives anyway. Just saying, you know, because the uh, um, Falmer, the Friends of Huntley at the LMA, is an amazing archive. Um, and I know uh, people like uh, Claudia Tomlinson, she's doing her PhD based on a lot of the material in those archives. Um, but definitely worth visiting. Um, Amaro said, it would be great to get an overview of what the family have and what is in that archive. From what I've heard, it's very comprehensive, which is great, yeah. So that's that's where most of it is, is at the LMA. Um, there's also a message from Dr. Kumar Mahabir. Um, and I know he runs, some, he runs an amazing event as well. He says, it's always a delight to join Guyana Speaks webinars. If you wish to join our weekly Sunday Indo-Caribbean Cultural Centre Zoom public meetings, uh, you can contact him. He's left his email address in there. He's actually based in Trinidad. Um, but yeah, that's from him. Um, oh. And I'm being corrected. Thank you, Peter Fraser, because I was totally confused <laughs> by the reference to Ian MacDonald. And Peter Fraser saying it's a different Ian, not the um, Ian MacDonald who lives in Guyana currently and writes poetry. It's uh, Ian, a lawyer. Um, Janet Lawrence says Angela Davis' sister and her lawyer came when Angela was in prison. Yeah. Oh, and thank you, Beverly, for mentioning the Cy Grant archives. Um, actually, Rod and I helped with the um, cataloging, I don't know if you remember, Rod. <laughs> we had some fun days at the London Metropolitan Archive. So if anybody is interested in Cy Grant as well, um, definitely pay a visit to the London Metropolitan Archives. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, it's 4.51, I guess, if anybody has any questions. Um, but I think what I'm going to do now is just say, if we could just say thank you to the presenters, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Amaros. Um, you know, thank you oh, for having me. It's been really lovely. It's lovely, and also I forgot. I want it's it's actually your dad's. What was your dad's birthday on the tenth? Yeah, the tenth. It was on the tenth, right? Yeah. So, so that's actually why we ended up doing it today. It was kind of to mark the tenth birth, um, your father's. Mm -hmm birthday on the 10th of March so yeah just to uh, put that out there but um yeah and if you stay in touch Amar, that'd be fantastic just let us know how you're getting on with the um research and if you find out anything amazing that you want to share with us please do likewise it feels like a massive cross-referencing exercise but yeah it's like but we're, we're getting there we're getting there and um as soon as we've kind of sorted through everything we can look at finding a home for it all. Exactly. No, brilliant. Thank, thank you. you. Um, of course, thank you to Linton Quasi Johnson. Um, I have to say I'm so grateful for him uh, spending time with us. I know he was really busy today, so it was really kind of him just to pop in and, and talk to us for a good 20 odd minutes. Thank you as well, Henry. 
Really appreciate you're you're contacting us from where? From the Cayman. Cayman Islands, yeah. Okay, so that's really nice. Um, Beverly's mentioned, and this is a really important one for everybody to note. This is a date for your diary. Um, the International Book Fair has um, the 40th anniversary Huntley Conference on the 23rd of April. It's going to be online. Um, I believe I've already posted it to Guyana Speak, so there should be a link there. But um, Beverly's actually just put it now into the chat so you can book your tickets there. Um, Akabra says, Dad says, it is especially lovely to see you even though on screen. Who, who's, who's your dad talking to? <laughs> Sorry, I should clarify. <laughs> um, dad is sending special wishes to Amma Rose and he would oh, really, nice. really oh. like to, um, to be in touch. Oh, that's really nice. Is your dad sitting next to you? He's sitting, he's sitting next to me. Oh. Okay. We're all sending you our love and our thoughts. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, and then Terry Murray says, sorry to note on a completely unrelated thing. Ah, okay. I've been browsing with Facebook. I was suddenly knocked off. Oh dear. Okay. And I cannot now browse. Uh, have you changed the settings? No. Not sure what's happening there. I'll have to check that out. Uh, Christine Barnes says, thanks to all the speakers and organizing organizers, fantastic webinar. Okay, brilliant. Um, if there's, has anybody got any questions or I kind of feel like we've come to a nice point. It's nearly five, so we're ready to round off. But if anybody has any last thoughts they want to share. I am just so sorry I'm late. I rushed up from Cumbria. <laughs> oh my um, goodness, Ayla. I, I was, I was in Cumbria, Cumbria for, since Friday. <laughs> and I, I only got in 